Over the past 12 months, the media landscape has been reshaped as digital rights become far more prevalent. Sports rights negotiations now hinge on digital streaming. Ross Greenwood caught up with James Manning, the editor of Media Week, to talk about what's in store next year. Sports rights have become essential to keeping an audience. I mean, the former Seven uh, chief executive used to say, look, I'm not sure how many might be watching one of our dramas in 12 months' time, but I know what the football will do, I know what the cricket will do. They're guaranteed audiences. And because of that, the, um, the cost has just gone up. There's been a lot of competition for that. The next one we'll see, the cricket's in play now. What will happen to that? I'm sure we'll see a, a reasonable increase. You, um, contract on contract when that's settled. And the interesting part about this is that the the new streaming giants are now showing a propensity to move into this space. Now, they can see, like everybody else can see, the sport is the number watched, number one watched, you know, event on television. It doesn't matter whether you're streaming it or whether you're watching it directly. And so they're not, you know, immune. They need to have a reason why the eyeballs, why the people will pay to go to their services. Yeah, it's been a little bit problematic for the streaming um, platform sport, but we've seen, I guess, the biggest um, person who's dived in has been Stan, mm -hmm. you know, with the tennis... Um, they've got the rugby. Um, we've seen Prime take some swimming. There's a bit of NFL they have, but as yet, there hasn't been a, a lot of sport. We, Netflix have held back from getting in there. So it's still largely the domain of the free-to-air broadcast. And KO, say, for example, showed that there was an appetite for streaming. So Foxtel pivoted to go to that streaming service and, and it certainly was highly popular being able to completely stream all of your data. This is the, the beauty of the way in which Australians are now consuming information and data. Yeah, I, I guess here I should have mentioned KO, but I guess that's usually seen as part of the subscription TV platform. It's a, it's a Foxtel offshoot. But, yeah, you're right. Wow, has that been successful? It's really helped turn around Foxtel, which was sort of stagnant. There wasn't a... didn't seem a clear way forward for it. But then they, they launched KO, fantastically successful. But, again, it's cost them, you know, it's cost them dearly. So sports rights aren't getting any cheaper, as you mentioned. And then they've sort of replicated that with Binge, which is the non-sport uh, platform. And that has overtaken uh, KO in terms of subscriber numbers. Look, it's been a bargain, ten dollars a month you can get in there. It's the nearly the cheapest thing going around. Will they? They'll probably need to lift that price to make it sort of a bit more profitable. But at the moment, doing very well. Okay, so then take me back to a few other bits and pieces on that media landscape because it's number one about the advertising, the advertising revenue you can get for sponsorships when you create the content, when you get the eyeballs on that content. But it's about taking that sponsorship further these days, isn't it? It's about the digital rights. It's about the slicing up of the content and being able to sell it so many different ways across all of the various platforms that are out there. Yeah, look, the digital right, rights used to be an afterthought. You know, the, the AFL... They went to Telstra. There wasn't a lot of interest in TV hanging on to it. I think the same with the NRL. Um, the cricket, Seven famously, didn't get the digital rights when they first got the cricket back, which was seen as a bit of a mistake in retrospect. Uh, but now it's very essential. And you, as you say, look at what Foxtel's able to do with KO. If they didn't have those digital rights, you, you wouldn't have KO. It just wouldn't be there. But it's, a, yeah, it's an essential thing now to have those digital knowledge. There's always that battle between um, free to air and um, subscription, who will get the digital rights. We've seen in the latest AFL deal, they're going to be split a little bit. Seven, for the first time, gets to keep the digital rights for the free-to-air games it has, mm. while Foxtel also has the digital rights for, you know, they use on Fox Footy, I'm talking the AFL, and um, KO. So this is, is it, this is all content, right? So it's interesting. You go to V8 Supercars. You know, the, the V8 Supercar teams are actually almost the actors on the stage. <laughs> the AFL teams are the actors on the stage. But then when it goes to drama, of course, trying to create that content is becoming ever more, uh, ever more uh, sort of costly to those businesses. You've got Disney bringing Bob Iger back in because the Disney Plus channel has certainly been successful, but they're going to find ways to be able to commercialise that you've got Netflix now, you know, cash flow positive. So there's a lot of changes in this landscape in terms of the, the power of these organisations to continue to pump out that content. Yeah, look, I think we're going to see that. It's the free-to-air TV has been sort of helped the um, streamers, if you like. They've backed away from drama. It's been a lot more on sport. It's been a lot more on reality TV. Drama's not made so much anymore, but we've seen, OK, that streamers have identified that. 
you know, Netflix has built itself off the back of good dramas. You think of House of Cards, which yeah. was their big first global breakthrough show, you know, The Crown. You know, they're still, they sort of almost have that space to themselves. There's still drama on free to air, but nothing like that the, um, the cut through and the engagement that the streamers have been able to create. Okay, but all of these businesses rely on consumer sentiment and consumer spending because it's either advertisers who require those consumers to spend for their products or indeed for streaming services where people might have three or four suddenly saying, actually, we might now flick between one and the other. They're jumping between the services to be able to go, oh, we like The Crown, we'll go there. Oh, we like a different series, we'll go there. It, it, it's an interesting dynamic, the way in which behaviour, the consumer behaviour is also changing. Yeah, look, consumer spend is going to be huge focus next year for everybody from from free to air with, with the budgets, is there going to be impact there? For streaming services, there's a bit of research around that shows, you know, over 50% of people will be cutting their spend on streaming platforms, you know, so there's a bit of jostling around about what will they keep? You know, most people expect probably keep Netflix. It's almost the default brand, isn't it, when you think of streaming services? But lots of, you know, Disney Plus, uh, Paramount, they're both undergoing big sort of... Uh, Amazon Prime, Apple, yeah. oh, you've got yeah. all of these things, yeah. right? So there's so many of them out there now. Absolutely, yeah. And they're all sort of, you know, they have um, share price pressures too, you know, when their subscriber numbers go up or down. It doesn't necessarily impact the company hugely. You see Netflix, it might only be a million or two out of 200 million plus, but that can send the share price up or down significantly. Then they have to be seen to react to that. Um, and then that can impact what they spend on content. Well, I'll tell you what, Joan, it's going to be fascinating watching over the next 12 months because clearly consumer behaviour is driving all of this. But then it changes the content we see, the prices we pay, and, if you like, the viability of many of those companies. Many thanks for your time today. Thanks, Ross.